Uh, I'm Jim Baker, the Director of National Security and Cybersecurity at the R Street Institute in Washington, D.C. Welcome to this webinar to talk about encryption and the Earn It Act and a variety of, of topics, hopefully, that uh, are uh, still current on everybody's mind, even though many of us are focused on COVID-19, which we will talk about uh, in a few minutes. I'm very uh, pleased and honored today to have uh, with me uh, Mike Chertoff, who is, uh, as many of you know, the former Secretary of Homeland Security, is a former federal judge, former U.S. attorney, and former assistant attorney general for the criminal division, which is where I think, uh, Mike, you and I first met. So right. it's, it's, it's great to be with you again. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I think in retrospect, uh, you know, we had tried to do this as a live event back in March, and I'm quite happy that uh, we did not do that. I think it was a time when uh, everybody was trying to figure out exactly what to do with respect to the coronavirus and COVID-19, and I, I think it was a wise move. So uh, unfortunately, it was disruptive to folks who had signed up. I apologize for that. You're not getting a, a lunch this time. But uh, anyway, welcome, and uh, I look forward to having a, a good discussion with Mike about these topics. So maybe just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters for everyone. So uh, you're all on mute, so we can't hear you the way we have this, this set up. Um, Mike and I are going to talk for a bit, maybe 35, 40 minutes, about a variety of topics, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. So to ask questions, you'll see at the bottom of, uh, of the screen that uh, you have the various options to chat and, and other things. Uh, please don't do that. Please don't raise your hand or anything like that. What we'll use is there's a Q&A function at the bottom. So uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, please uh, submit it in that way, and I will uh, I'll ask the question. Uh, I will, unless you really want to be identified, I won't identify you uh, for the uh, for the question. I already have one question about whether this event is being recorded. It is being recorded. So um, anyway, we, we're going to figure out a way to try to make it available to uh, to others. So uh, with that, I think uh, I think we'll get started. So um, so Mike, uh, obviously, you know, given your uh, prior experience in the government, a variety of different jobs, especially at uh, at DHS as the head of DHS, and then uh, I understand now you're uh, engaged. You have a role with respect to helping the District of Columbia government uh, deal with COVID nineteen and the pandemic and everything associated with that. So uh, you know it would be I think I'd be remiss if we didn't start off chatting about that because it's on everyone's mind. So. Um, you know, I'm just going to ask you an open-ended question about, you know, what general observations do you have about how well the country is doing, how you see the current situation, and uh, where you see us going in the immediate future and in the long term. I mean, we're all trying to figure that out. Well, so let me begin by saying this is not an unforeseen event. I mean, the specific uh, viruses, but the notion of a pandemic or even a biological terrorist attack is something we were planning for back when I was at DHS in the period 2005 to 2009. <clears throat> in fact, we put together a pretty detailed playbook. We did exercises. Uh, we talked about stockpiling and <clears throat> necessary medical equipment. The idea of social distancing was actually part of what that plan called for, um, as well as obviously trying to get um, a, an antidote together. We also dealt with the issue of how to distribute uh, antidotes or, or therapeutics, uh, particularly in the context of bioterrorism. So this is not an unforeseen event. Um, I would say that what has been revealed is that uh, the planning apparently did not really resonate at this point, uh, whether it was a question of having had a number of near misses with SARS and MERS and people got complacent or just the passage of time um, it seems we were, we were somewhat slow to get off the mark, both in terms of identifying the problem and beginning to put into effect measures to deal with uh, contacting, contact tracing, and um, you know perhaps controlling travel that might have mitigated, although I don't think they would have eliminated this particular problem. The other thing which is exposed is we, we live in a business culture now where everything is hyper-efficient. It's everything is just in time. We don't want to have any extra stuff. Just the supply chain is designed so we just get what we need right at the moment we need it because in theory that saves money. The problem is when you hit a bump in the road, everything winds up getting affected. And so what we've learned is that in the absence of a certain amount of redundancy and resiliency, 
it becomes much harder to catch up and to mitigate uh, a threat like a pandemic. Another thing we've learned is when you, again, in the interest of efficiency and saving expense, you put all of your supply chain eggs in one basket. You go to, for example, located in China or in other parts of Asia, and you get all your basic components, whether it be medicine or technology, from there, it may appear to be less expensive, but if there is a problem with travel or a problem with the uh, pandemic hitting in that region of the world, all of a sudden you find yourself high and dry. So what, what I am hoping for and what I anticipate emerging from this crisis when it ends is a renewed um, investment in planning, preparation, and exercising for these kinds of events, as well as a more widely distributed supply chain and some investment in resiliency or additional um, um, countermeasures so that we don't get in a situation where as soon as you hit a bump in the road, you actually have no margin for error. So just two quick follow-ups to, to that. So uh, in the planning that you did and the thinking you, that you and others had done about it, you know, for almost two decades now, uh, did you foresee or was it contemplated, you know, sort of the broad and deep economic impact that this pandemic has had as a result of the shelter-in-place orders? And, and relatedly, you know, did, how, how do you think about the relationship between the federal government and the states? I mean, that, that was always, in, in my work at DOJ on emergency planning, uh, that was always a, a complicated and, and thorny issue with respect to like figuring out if you had like a terrorist incident at the scene, who's responsible for what and how does that happen? And, and so on. There was always a little bit tricky, especially if it was a broad event. But anyway, how do you think about the economic and, you know, federalism implications of all this? Well, I think, I think we always knew there would be hardship involved in sheltering in place and in social distancing and in cutting off uh, travel and things like that. And the issue is, how do you balance that um, against the fact that you want to slow and ultimately stop uh, a pandemic? And of course, we were looking at things that were potentially more deadly than um, the COVID-19 that we're now dealing with. Um, although this particular virus is, is a, a tricky to deal with because there are so many people who are asymptomatic and the incubation period is so long that people can spread quite a bit before they know they have it. I mean, with some of the more serious kinds of, of, um, anti, you know, of vectors, you wind up uh, getting very sick very quickly and you're not inclined to leave the house because you don't feel like it. Um, so this has made it a little trickier. But look, we always understood there was a trade-off. And I'm not going to argue that everybody should be locked down until there's no more uh, individual in the world that has the virus, because that would destroy our societies and cause all kinds of negative collateral effects. What you have to do is look to um, move the trajectory to a flat or a downward slope, and then open up uh, the economy in a way that's measured um, and is still careful and allows you, if necessary, to reverse course if it looks like you're getting an uptick again. So it really is a question of getting as much data as you can and calibrating your responses so that you don't eliminate the risk because you can't eliminate the risk, but that you manage the risk down. Now, as far as, as the role of the federal and state government, when you're dealing with a terrorist attack, uh, you know, you're drawing on the president's war powers and um, <clears throat> foreign policy issues. And that obviously gives greater authority. Here, much of the actual authority is at the state level with governors. And what uh, the federal government can do is under the Stafford Act, as it would in a, in a natural disaster, it can supply resources and money and um, assist the state governors in carrying out their responsibilities. The Defense Production Act allows um, the uh, federal government to take charge of parts of the economy in order to direct supplies to wh where they need to go. But in terms of the quarantining authorities, as I understand it, the federal government's authorities are limited to international interstate travel. Within the individual states, much if not all of the authority rests with the governors. And that's why, and this is true with any natural disaster, it's not a command and control system. It's a question of achieving unity of effort 
by having a cooperative relationship, transparency, and regular communication. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Very good. Well, uh, again, thanks for, thanks for talking about that. As I say, I think it's probably on everybody's mind and it would have been a missed opportunity not to chat with you a lot about that a little bit. All right, so let's turn to the, the topic that people signed up for, which is uh, encryption, the Earn It Act, uh, and related topics. So uh, I want to make sure, you know, I anticipate that we have folks in the audience from a variety of different uh, perspectives and levels of understanding, but obviously they're interested in this or they wouldn't have signed up for it. So uh, in talking about encryption, I guess I want to start out from a cybersecurity perspective, perhaps just to pick your brain a little bit on how you see at a high level in a short, you know, in a relatively short framework, uh, how you think about cybersecurity as it relates to encryption, but more generally, you know, how you think about the, the threat landscape from uh, malicious cyber actors, you know, today, especially when we're also dependent, uh, uh, much more dependent uh, for carrying on our day-to-day -day activities on the internet and the digital ecosystem than we had been even before. Well, and, and this is again, <clears throat> a matter of risk management. I mean, I might point out that the coronavirus has really underscored uh, the challenge to cybersecurity because we, we are putting much more of our activities online now. We can't do them in person. And a lot of people are working from home and they're using devices that are not necessarily configured to be the most secure. So that means there's a greater surface area for attacks. And that means that there is a greater risk to sensitive data or even industrial control systems to the extent you are managing those online. We're talking about telemedicine. We're talking about sensitive medical records. We may be talking about collecting data about people's travel and behavior that has relevance to uh, plotting the course of the pandemic. And this apart from all the regular business activities. So what encryption does is it provides a very important tool to protect data when the network is vulnerable and therefore someone can get in and look at the data. Because with encryption, they may be able to look at the data, but they can't read it. It doesn't, it's not translatable into content. And that's why encryption is considered a very important part of cybersecurity. And it gives you a backup to protect data at the data element level, as opposed to at the network level or the endpoint level. And um, while encryption is not perfect, and depending on the nature of the encryption, sometimes it can be cracked, it is certainly an obstacle to most bad actors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so that's, that's a great intro. So when we're talking about, you know, I worked closely on the uh, uh, dispute between Apple and the FBI. So people think about, uh, you know, their iPhones and their uh, Android phones and so on with respect to their passcodes, and how those are protected. And then people throw around end-to-end -end encryption and uh, what, what I've found is that there's a lot of, honestly, in, in, in policy debates, a lot of conflating of issues and a bit of confusion about, uh, you know, what you're talking about when you speak about encryption. And then there's the cloud and how does it work there and so on. So what, I don't know, do you want to just take a minute and maybe just between the two of us just sort of flesh out, like when somebody talks about encryption, how do you, how do you think about that? What does that mean to you? Uh, and what do you see as some of maybe the key distinctions between those various types of encryption? So I, I think, you know, basically I divide into two categories. I mean, there's encryption of data itself, data in motion or data at rest. Data in motion is I'm sending you an email and it's encrypted. Data at rest means I have um, content in, a, in my network or, or um, stored someplace, but it's stored in encrypted form. So if someone were to break in, they would not be able to read it. That's one category of issues, and that's protecting the data, the data element. The other thing is device encryption, or the inability to break into a device, which really relates to the endpoint, and largely to your smartphones. And that's what was involved with this um, ver uh, um, uh, case out in Bakersfield, case out in California, with um, the issue about a phone that couldn't be broken into because many phones nowadays, you have a code and if you try multiple um, combinations and you miss, you know, eight, 10, 12 times, all of a sudden the operating system locks down. And that's designed to prevent people from simply going through every combination of four digits until they hit the right one. 
that's designed to protect everything on your phone, not just the data at the data level, but all the functionality, the photos, all those kinds of things. Uh, from a security standpoint, the former, the encryption of the data is probably the, the more important uh, because you're really protecting critical data no matter where it's located. This is the, the, this is the data in motion you're talking about, right? Correct. Or, or, yeah. or at rest, but in like of the cloud, for example. I see, okay. On your phone, it's important to protect your phone, but unless somebody gets a hold of your phone, there's not really an issue there. And uh, what's at risk then is a per, an individual's phone, but not necessarily um, the, you know, a, a broad range of people. Nevertheless, depending on where you are in the world, there are some places where you don't want to have your phone easily opened by others, let you know, criminals or, or thieves or, or uh, even the authorities. So, I mean, I think these are all about the trade-off between securing the data and securing your endpoint versus the desire of the authority sometimes to look at the data or to look at the endpoint. Okay, so that's a great transition then to the, so uh, to, to the next topic, which is the, the law enforcement perspective on this. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about the impact that uh, encryption has had sort of increasingly over time. I mean, I've observed it spreading, uh, you know, in terms of the different types of platforms on which encryption is employed over over many years, and it's, it's definitely had an, an impact. And so, you know, let's just talk about that. What, what do you understand to be law enforcement's main concerns about encryption and how is it impacting their ability to do their jobs? And, and how, do you, how do you evaluate those, uh, those concerns? Well, let me, let me begin by, by emphasizing the importance of encryption as a general security measure for everyone. And more and more people are using encrypted applications, you know, to speak, um, to do video, to do audio, as well as to transmit you know, written data like emails or, or things of that sort. And the reason it's important is because more and more of the traffic goes taking pathways you may not anticipate. And that's particularly going to be true, uh, and certainly in parts of the world where the Chinese are building the infrastructure um, that under, undergirds 5G, which is the next generation of uh, you know, uh, network infrastructure, you have to wonder, are the Chinese going to be able to look at what you say or what you're doing for whatever reason? And if you think that they don't want to bother most people, I commend you the number of major hacks that have been undertaken to steal millions and millions of files of data on individuals. As in, in my view, the Chinese try to build a massive database about Americans. So with that in mind, you know, not knowing necessarily exactly which path your data is going to travel, encryption is something that gives you a degree of confidence that no one is going to wind up peering into what you're sending and using it for their own purposes. Now, I understand that, you know, from law enforcement standpoint, when you're investigating somebody, you would like to see what they're saying or what they're writing. And that's the same impulse, Jim, as you know, when we wiretapped people or used electronic surveillance to put a bug someplace, that was a great way to gather evidence against organized crime figures or other kinds of criminals. The question is, are there other ways to do that? And is the opportunity to get this additional evidence so important that we're willing to put everybody's security at risk in order to build a weakness or, or a loophole in the encryption system? And so then it becomes, uh, that kind of leads me to the next thing, it, it, it kind of leads to a, uh, a, a balancing question, I guess, between the interests of, of law enforcement and uh, the, the benefits society that, that you just talked about. I mean, one of the things that I've wondered about and worried about is whether over the years, because we've become, as a society, we've become so dependent upon uh, this type of technology that, and we transact and do so many things on, uh, on devices, that you know, law enforcement has become equally dependent upon that to be able to to craft their cases. And how, what, do, you, do you have a reaction to that thought, Jim? I think you're absolutely right, and I, I've thought exactly the same thing. Um, you know, it, it, it's an easy way to make a case, and I've done it with cases uh, where you intercept someone on the phone, or you have a bug in a, in a location, 
and that pre prevents terrific that presents terrific evidence to use in court. But sometimes when you're dealing with particularly sophisticated criminals, even in the old days, they knew how to evade it. So I, I did a lot of mafia cases. And you know, the most skilled senior members, 99% of the time, if they had a sensitive conversation, they either turned the radio way up so you couldn't hear it, or they went out and took a walk. Yeah. And you can't stop people from taking measures to defeat the possibility of electronic surveillance. Likewise, it, um, I can't imagine a scenario in which people couldn't find a way to use encryption, even if the government required most companies to put some kind of a backdoor uh, in or duplicate key, because you're always going to, because basically encryption is math. You can't stop math. And someone will always be able to design a, an encryption system um, that they can market to people on the dark web. So to me, this is a little bit like, um, you know, my sympathy for the difficulty of making a case, but also my sense that from my personal experience, in the old days, we did it the old fashioned way. You called witnesses, you had, you know, uh, circumstantial evidence, um, you bargained with people to get them to testify. You didn't always get conversations on a silver platter. Right, no, that's, yeah, that's definitely, there's many, in, in, electronic surveillance is an investigative tool. It's not an investigation in and of itself. There's plenty of tools that, that law enforcement has. That's that's for sure. I just want to touch real quick on um, the, you know, this is not just a, a problem for law enforcement in the United States. This is a, a problem for our foreign partners uh, as well. Is that is that right? And what do you, what's your thinking about that and the interactions that you might have had on you know, with the, especially, you know, the, the so-called Five Eyes, uh, US, UK, Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. I, I think most people in law enforcement and, you know, among our allies have a similar attitude. I mean, I've talked to some in the Five Eyes and they're less concerned about um, data on the, you know, cracking the device open or data at, at rest. They're more interested in the data in motion, if it's actually being communicated live. But I think they all recognize, obviously not being able to get uh, access to data because it's encrypted, does pose an obstacle. Now, if you go to another part of the world, in China, they definitely don't want encryption because they want to be able to use data as a way of controlling the population and punishing the people whose ideas they don't want. And ironically, they're even beginning to export that model by threatening to retaliate against US companies, for example, that might have Taiwan on them on a map instead of calling it China, because they want to basically push people into adopting the party line. So there again, encryption actually plays a role in national security by giving American and European and other democratic uh, countries the ability to protect their enterprises against being bullied by autocrats. Okay, okay, good. Uh, all right, so let me, uh, just in the interest of time, I wanna make sure we uh, we move on and talk about the Earn It Act. So I'll just, I'll, I'm gonna jump to that right now. So, uh, so one of the things that DOJ started to do, Department of Justice, U.S. Department of Justice started to do uh, in a much more concerted way, I guess I would say, starting last year, really, with uh, a speech by the uh, Attorney General Barr and, and other comments, is to try to link the encryption issue to cases and investigations uh, relating to the online sexual exploitation of children. And so, and, and that then gets played out in the Earn It Act, um, in which, uh, you know, some members of Congress uh, are trying to decrease the amount of child sexual abuse material that's that's in circulation and being produced. Uh, and it creates a commission. I'll just read a, a part of it here. It says the, it, it creates a commission to establish best practices. So it says the purpose of the commission is to develop recommended best practices for providers of interactive computer services regarding the prevention of online, online child uh, sexual, chi online child exploitation uh, conduct. And so the basic idea is to link these best practices to um, uh, to Section 230 uh, of the Communications Decency Act. Uh, do I have the right act? I think so, yeah. Yeah, to, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. 
um, and the liability protections, I won't go into those here, but uh, we can talk about more if you want, but um, to link you know, the basic idea of child exploitation, encryption, and Section 230 protection and liability, to link all those through together uh, in an effort to address those problems, but cynically some are concerned that that's a, an effort to try to just uh, shove through a way to decrease the ability of companies to employ encryption. So let's talk about the Earned Act. What do you understand about about that uh, set of problems? How do you think about that? Obviously, everybody wants to address those kind of cases, but uh, you know, sort of, what's your reaction to the act, and how do you think about the problem? You know, we, you know, obviously, people, you know, child pornography and and child abuse is a horrible thing, and therefore, you know, people immediately and understandably become emotionally invested in trying to suppress that, and if you know, someone wants to put together a commission to look at what are the ways you might defeat this, recognizing that an awful lot of this goes on in the dark web, um, which is uh, presents a whole separate set of investigative issues. You know, maybe they'll come up with some solution no one has thought of that doesn't compromise encryption, but allows you to use metadata or artificial intelligence to determine certain kind of patterns of behavior that are indicative of uh, child abuse without actually decrypting the data. Um, I, I can't answer the question. What I wouldn't want to see would be saying you got to build a backdoor or weaken encryption so someone can't use it for purposes of transmitting child pornography. Because again, you're sacrificing security of the many uh, to get some few bad apples. I might say I'm a, you know, there have been investigative techniques used in the dark web, not involving breaking encryption, that have been quite successful, including one where um, the FBI, I think, was able to lure people who were seeking this kind of material into clicking on a particular dark web site, and they're able to track that back to a particular IP address, and that creates evidence that someone is, you know, seeking that kind of material. So. I mean, if you want to have a commission to look at options that would not defeat the purpose of encryption, I mean, that's fine. What I would not want to see is an argument, you have to build a back door um, if you want to have liability protection. Mm -hmm. And that's for the reasons that you talked about earlier with respect to the exactly. rule. Exactly. When you have a back door, you've weakened encryption. Right, right, right. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, but let me ask this. I mean, so I'll sort of be devil's advocate for a second. So, but the argument is, you know, really that these, the, so especially Attorney General Barr, uh, the argument is, look, you know, these, these systems are creating a, what he refers to as a, you know, a warrant proof encryption, a law, a warrant free zone, uh, different phrases like that, that you know, historically, there have not been places in America where, you know, I mean, I get your point about the mafia folks who could walk out on the street uh, and have a conversation, you know, trying to avoid electronic surveillance. But there even, you know, the, the government could use a microphone or something or perhaps follow them. And I think that was done in some of the mob cases outside of, you know, the John Gotti case. They would, they put microphones, I think, in the parking meters, if I recall reading the public record uh, correctly. But, you know, there's, there's, but so the, the Attorney General and other folks at DOJ are quite concerned that, you know, there's this, this spread of encryption is just going to make it so much easier for these bad guys to do what they want to do and, and create this novelty in American history and American jurisprudence where the government can get a warrant all the time it wants to, uh, but there's nothing that can be done to actually affect it. Do, do, do you think that, that, that always that's always been true. You can get a warrant to search someone's house, and if they, if when you knock at the door, they flush the evidence down the toilet, I guess you're not going to get the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, you know, we we have not operated in a society like China, where you are obliged to have everything visible at all times in case the authorities want to investigate. And I will tell you, when you talk, generally speaking, about the tools available now to investigate, there are many more tools now in the electronic age than was true 30, 40 years ago. I mean, the meta availability of metadata, locational data, um, similar kinds of information, you know, m some of which should require a warrant, but nevertheless exists, and particularly in the hands of third parties, 
means there's a much greater ability to investigate almost every kind of case than was the case before we had all these smartphones and everything. So if you're asking me as an investigator, am I happier with the tools I have in 2020 than I was with what I had in 1980? The answer to that's got to be yes. Because of the metadata, because of all the other information. Correct. Location data, metadata, yeah. um, all kinds of things. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and then what, wh how do you think about the responsibility of the companies as they, as they roll out these type of systems? I mean, should they be trying to make their, uh, their equipment and, and platforms and systems more available? You know, what, what is their responsibility? And I remember there was a hearing that the Senate Judiciary Committee had last fall where Congress was saying um, that, you know, if the companies don't fix it, they're going to have to, meaning Congress. So just real quick, just before we go to questions, so what do you think about the, the relative roles of the companies? What's their responsibility? And given all the equities there that are at play here, What's the role of Congress here? Should is Congress the one that should decide what to do, and and how do you see you know their role in all this? I mean, I think the companies. I, I'm not familiar with any reputable company that wants to promote criminal activity online. Although, again, I'll emphasize there's a whole dark web operated by criminal groups um, that are you know are, are definitely servicing crime, and they want to be investigated and punished, but they're not obeying the law anyway. Right. Um, uh, I think the Silk Road was one of them. So I think the companies do want to do the right thing. I think the challenge they have is a simple mathematical challenge. If you build a duplicate key or you build a back door, you have weakened encryption. And that means bad guys can break it. And that defeats the security of um, all of these devices and all of the data and could result in a serious impact. For example, if someone was able to decrypt um, data and manipulate an industrial control system, they could result in people getting killed. Mm -hmm. So the companies have an obligation to be able to preserve encryption to make it useful as a security tool. And again, Congress, uh, I mean, they need to educate themselves about what are the limits of your ability to curtail encryption without more generally damaging uh, security across the board. If there are other tools or other capabilities, um, great. I mean, Congress ought to look into those things. But uh, the idea that there's a magic bullet in requiring a gap in encryption um, is a little bit like saying, well, like everybody, you know, ought to be required to have all conversations inside because if they go outside and have a conversation, we might not be able to intercept it. And that's not a reasonable position in a free society. Um, that's kind of what you see in China, to be quite frank. Okay, okay. Um, so we'll go to questions in one second. Uh, the if I could just ask folks to please use the the Q and A function and not to put your hand up because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use that to try to uh, answer a question because you won't be able we won't be able to hear you. The, you're all everybody's on mute. Uh, and so if you could just send your question using the Q and A function at the bottom, please don't use the chat function. So anyway, Mike, before we turn to those, any, any last thoughts or observations before we, um, we go to questions on, on the general topic? You know, I understand that the frustration when you can't get at evidence, um, but I also think we have to recognize no law is going to stop people from marketing uh, encryption and other kinds of devices over the dark web that will be used by criminals. So what will happen if we weaken encryption is this law-abiding people will be more easily victimized. Sophisticated terrorists and criminals will find a way, nevertheless, to keep what they do secret. So, I, I mean, to me, although I understand this is a little bit like a going dark problem uh, that was, you know, several decades ago in terms of telephonic interceptions, at the end of the day, it was not a, an insuperable problem in terms of intelligence collection or prosecution. And I think we can find enough tools to work our way around this as well. Okay, okay, great. Well, so we have one question uh, that we'll start out with uh, uh, is about, about the impact of quantum computing. So quantum on, on encryption. So quantum computing is on the horizon and uh, will encryption evolve, I'm sorry, evolve 
to say homomorphic uh, encryption, which I only sort of understand, uh, or will encryption somehow become irrelevant? What's your understanding about quantum computing and the implications of that uh, on, on encryption and this landscape that we're talking about? Right, it's a great question. I don't want to overstate <coughs> my mathematical skills, but um, my understanding is that this actually can be uh, both a plus and a minus. I know that people in various companies that are working on using quantum computing as a way of really more robustly uh, increasing the security of encryption. You know, over time, what's happened is the length of encryption, the number of bits you use to encrypt, um, that you need to have in order to be secure has increased because people have come up with ways to break encryption with smaller and smaller um, uh, length of, of encrypted bits. On the other hand, it may be that quantum computing will create so much compute power that it'll be possible to actually decrypt anything. And what, what I don't think any of us knows yet is who will win this race. Will the encryptors or the decryptors win the race of quantum computing? But that's clearly going to be the next area of development in this subject. Yeah, do you, do you have any thoughts about sort of the race between the United States and China? Well, I guess, you know, I was going to say on quantum computing, uh, but more generally, I mean, in terms of uh, the race to, to have, to be able to protect our communications, our, you mean the United States and its allies, communications infrastructure uh, with respect to, to China and the advances uh, and money that it's throwing at the, at the problem. Well, this gets us to the 5G problem, which is, um, you know, if the only game in town is Huawei, then the Chinese will wind up basically having a chokehold on the hardware and software for the next generation of network data transmission, <clears throat> which means they'll have the ability, um, particularly if it's unencrypted, to see what's being transmitted. And they may even have the ability to actually create obstacles or take down parts of the network. Now, there are some other companies like, uh, I won't mention names, but in Europe, you know, from like-minded nations that are competitors, and also I think in Korea, um, the question is, can we assist them to scale and to be price competitive. I know that's what the administration is trying to do in the US, but we're also trying to get our allies to do that. And there's a mixed response because the Chinese have been very good at flooding the zone with um, all kinds of subsidies and preferences that give Huawei a head start on producing good quality and relatively inexpensive hardware and software tools. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Um, we have another question. I'll switch the gears a little bit here. Uh, we sort of talked about the idea that going dark uh, makes investigations harder, so encryption makes investigations harder. But could you expand on the idea that that pushing very various illegal activities further into the dark web that you mentioned makes it much harder and not easier for law, law enforcement to investigate and track these issues? Yet, does shoving people into the dark web, what, what impact does that have? Well, because when you are dealing with you know the, the regular internet, um, you know, as I said, there's, there are tools like metadata, things of that sort. Uh, even artificial intelligence can help you analyze behavior in a way that's useful. When you get into the dark web, you're going into areas where the government may not know what's going on. They may not have visibility to something, um, or they may be unaware of something. And there, so much of what actually occurs online is not visible to ordinary search engines that in many ways it makes it much easier for bad guys to conceal things, which is why that, for example, this Silk Road uh, that they brought down a couple of years ago in a, in a big case, which was marketing everything from child pornography to murder for hire uh, to tools that could be used for hacking. So, you know, it's, it's like uh, any other criminal activity. Uh, you can't have total visibility into everything. And the more you encourage people or incentivize them to go out of their way to operate in the darkest corners of the universe, the harder it's going to be to even rely on some of the things which are not encrypted. Mm -hmm. But the, the dark web is, I mean, the, the government spends a lot of time and effort uh, in investigating activities on the dark web and is well aware of what is, you know, is going on there. And so uh, it's not, it's, I, I mean, I guess my view would be it's not dark as to law enforcement. Law enforcement well, is quite- but It is a little darker in the sense that the volume is very high 
um, some of the the, the um, you know footprints and fingerprints you would get in the regular web are less visible. Uh, usually, what happens is you get some kind of a tip or a lead that takes you to a site. But um, I think driving more. Well, I guess what I'm saying is this: you are not going to find a way to prevent bad people from encrypting their data. Because as long as mathematics is open to everybody, people will come up with ways to develop encryption that isn't regulated and they will sell it. So I, I think it's a little bit of a false hope that somehow you can shut that down this alternative method of communication. Okay, got it. All right, let's uh, go back to talk about uh, our, our foreign partners. So the question is, have the except, exceptional access laws in Australia and the UK negatively impacted the ability to protect encryption in the US. The erosion of this, of this protection no longer seems limited to authoritarian regimes. So are foreign countries being too uh, e allies, you know, liberal democracies, are they being uh, too heavy handed and how is that impacting us? Well, I'm not in a position to evaluate, you know, what the effect has been in Australia or England. I mean, I can say that if you are transmitting data uh, into a country which has extraordinary access, it's going, it's, encryption is going to be weaker. How that plays out in any given case will depend on whether someone's trying to get that or not. But in general, as you lower the standard of encryption, you are creating a security vulnerability for everybody. And um, there again, I think what you're seeing is you get new tools come up um, that are being offered online that don't have built-in backdoors and people for legitimate or illegitimate reasons will gravitate to that. But most innocent people are not going to be sophisticated about finding those tools. So it's mainly going to be bad guys who can locate them. Okay. Next question. Now, this is a, a lengthy one here and let's see uh, if I can try to summarize it, but I'll, we'll go for it here. So le legally requiring online companies to backdoor their encryption, uh, meaning leave a backdoor open, seems like it would require amending uh, a particular section of CALEA, since online companies aren't bound by CALEA the way the telecoms are, which is true. Um, yet the Earned Act doesn't even mention CALEA. Uh, how do you think the Earned Act's uh, sponsors are choosing to pass legislation affecting encryption directly, or through this bill rather, uh, rather than directly, I'm sorry, rather than by writing a bill to amend CALEA directly? So how do you think, yeah, is, is it, just what do you make of of the way that the uh, the sponsors are doing this through the uh, through the Earned Act. I mean, I guess I would say my my, uh, my assumption, not being you know privy to how they're actually talking about it, is that by creating this commission and then creating a set of recommendations, they're they're kind of saying, as a judge once said to somebody I know, I can't make you do it, but I can make you wish you had. So they're trying to create an incentive for companies that want to preserve their liability protection to go along with a weakening rather than directly ordering it. Mm -hmm. And what's your, what's your sense of that? Is that a good legislative strategy from their perspective? I, I, I think it's just a device. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's just a different way of raising the same issue. How do we feel about encryption? And as I said, if the commission can come up with some alternative way to help investigators that doesn't require weakening encryption, maybe that's a great solution. But you know, I don't know if that's gonna happen. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, all right, let's see, it's a long one too. Facebook offered assurances, let's focus on Facebook. Fa Facebook offered assurances to lawmakers that providing end-to-end uh, -end encryption can coexist with preventing child exploitation through stronger safeguards and enforcement. Technologists also note that there are solutions that can help balance dueling privacy and safety needs. Do you think that these kinds of arguments will pe be persuasive to lawmakers in Congress? Well, I would say if, if there is an alternative solution that is, does not require weakening encryption, I think that's great. That's a, that's a win-win for everybody. For example, it may be um, information about people who are engaged in this kind of activity allows you to take down their sites or to put their sites under some kind of a restriction. It may also be, and here I, I, I'm, I'm, again, getting a little bit over my skis, that with the use of artificial intelligence, it may be possible to determine that there are certain kinds of ways people send things when they're dealing with illicit material that ought to caution you that perhaps something is, is a, a problem with that material. It may be something in the, in the manner in which people behave online 
um, like a telltale give or something like that. I guess they call it a tell when you're talking about poker. Yeah. So I'm willing, I'm open. I think it'd be great if you know, brilliant scientists can come up with alternative ways to keep this garbage off the internet without fundamentally impairing encryption. Yeah, my, I, I want to be careful what I say here, but my understanding is that, yes, in fact, uh, with respect to people engaged in activities related to the exploitation of children, that their online behavior is meaningfully different uh, than a normal person's yeah. behavior. Yeah, and so, I, 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 so and, and that's just, that, that's something you can ascertain absolutely uh, by just looking at the metadata and not, not looking right. at at the content at all, and it's it's yeah, and it, it apparently it stands out. So, okay, um, let's see, next one. Okay, uh, do you think it's possible that some platforms will opt for the scenario where they uphold encryption and accept liability, which would instead put pressure on free speech if they became conservative on content moderation? I guess making them much more aggressive to throw people off the platform. Uh, quickly and at scale, so it might depend on the nature of the platform what the business model is. If your if your business model is monetizing information, that may make it harder to, um, you know, accept the limitation of Section Two Hundred and Thirty. Um, you know, because you're trying to promote data and people using the tool. If you're simply charging a fee to transmit messages. Uh, you might decide that there's a very little risk that that you're not going to wind up with things that are subject to you know being you're being held liable to. Okay, okay. very good. Um, uh, we, did, we okay. Here's another question that just came in. Um, all right, let's see. Our policymakers, I guess, in the United States, concerned about the precedent that the uh, it I think this would uh, meaning the Earned Act would set for countries that may use the Earned Act to expand demands for surveillance slash monitoring on issues not related to child abuse? Hmm. Well, that's a really, a really interesting question. Um, I mean, this is an argument that has been made that all you're doing is you are basically validating uh, the arguments being made by the Chinese and the Russians about having visibility into the internet. Now, the one answer is the Chinese and the Russians are going to do it anyway. Um, whether you whether the U.S. does it or not, so you're not going to stop them from doing it. Um, but I do think that there is a, particularly when you're dealing with an audience of people around the world, uh, there is an importance in walking the walk and not just talking the talk. If we criticize the Chinese model and the Russian model and the North Korean model because they are operating surveillance states, um, then do we look hypocritical if it looks like we're trying to do the same thing, um, even if it seems to be limited in, in, a, in more of a subject matter way. And I, I hate to say it, but an example of this is Snowden. I mean, um, I think Snowden wrongly betrayed his country. I think he deliberately hyped up things in a way that made them seem uh, more privacy invasive than they were. And I think his stated rationale for going public with things that he stole doesn't fit with what he actually took. But I, I'll tell you honestly, having you know dealt with people in, in other countries, it it really caused the US to lose a lot of stature in making arguments on issues like wiretapping and electronic surveillance and things of that sort. And you see that it actually wound up um, reducing the ability to rely on some of these tools. Uh, this has nothing to do with encryption. This just has to do with metadata collection, for example. So the fact is there is a cost to American soft power, to use Joe Nye's term, when we look as if we are not applying a standard to ourselves that is similar to what we're telling others to subscribe to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So let's try to loop back. We have a, a couple more minutes uh, to, to kind of loop back to our discussion at the, at the beginning about the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, do you have any thoughts or what's, what, what's the state of your thinking right now on uh, the sort of the, the contact tracing, I'll use the word surveillance. I mean, I mean that from a healthcare perspective, you know, and the relationship between figuring out 
who may have been infected or who may have been in contact with the person who's infected and then like what are the what are the privacy implications for that sort of where, where, where's your thinking on that at this stage yeah that's a really that's a really topical question um, and I would say when people talk about using contact tracing with a device like your smartphone um, and there are really three broad categories of things one is can companies collect general data about movement that's anonymized that doesn't tell you who's going where but does tell you where people are concentrating and furnish that to the authorities that strikes me as you know relatively low risk um, and has some utility in mapping where you might get hot spots for contagion the other uh, thing that's being discussed which is an interesting prospect is that you would voluntarily download an app and if it turned out that you became exposed to the virus or you tested positive, you would enter that in the app. It would be anonymized, but everybody that had come within range over a period of time, as demonstrated by your Bluetooth, would get a notification. You've been exposed to somebody who has contracted the virus. Again, the name would not be mentioned, but it would tell people you may want to get yourself get tested. This may be actually an interesting thing that we do wind up gravitating to because it would allow people to know when they need to get tested once tests get more widely available. And then the third thing would be to actually use an app to inform the authorities whether somebody is straying out of where they should if they're under quarantine. That might be more limited to people who are being put in enforced quarantine or isolation that's probably the most controversial because that really involves not, a non, not anonymizing, but tracking individuals. Um, as we know from some of the most recent court developments, uh, using locational data to track people is increasingly getting court scrutiny in terms of requiring a warrant. But where you're dealing with public health, there might be a greater willingness to allow the government to collect that, at least with respect to people who are under quarantine. And if there was some strict limit placed on where that data could be transferred or who else could look at it. So I think this is actually a very topical area that we're going to be discussing over the next six months as we try to balance between a, a tool that may save lives, but also making sure it doesn't get abused. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the privacy protection is built on uh, the the consent aspect of this that you would be doing right. it knowingly in order to obtain a uh, a benefit uh, that is pretty clear from a public health perspective and so it wouldn't it wouldn't be something that's done surreptitiously you know by the government that type of thing where the collection is being done or the data is being sold behind your back and you don't have transparency uh, into it right exactly so I think we, we might have time for one more question um, and I think this this relates back to uh, one of the prior questions so. Um, with the expanse of government tracking post 9-11 and the expansion of surveillance laws, I guess those laws, but surveillance laws, for things like routine drug enforcement, uh, could you foresee that the uh, Earn It Act's reach would expand similarly? So sort of this, this concern that, uh, you know, that, the, that once, these, once laws get passed that expand the government's ability to conduct surveillance, they never get uh, retracted. And it's uh, always the government winning and, and privacy and civil liberties uh, losing. What's, sort of, what's your reaction to that sort of concept? I, I think that is uh, a very common phenomenon. We used to call it mission creep. And uh, the, what we used to say back when I was at the Department of Justice after 9 11, you probably remember this, Jim, is there'd be something that was going to be used for terrorists. We need to track this because it's going to tell us what a terrorist is. We have to save lives. And of course, in the wake of 9-11, it's very hard not to understand the importance of that. And then sooner or later, someone would say, well, we need this to track deadbeat dads. And you go, well, wait a second, they're not terrorists. They're just not paying their child support. And you'd hear, what's the matter? You don't believe children should get child support? You don't like kids? And so we used to call that mission creep. And one of the lessons I think I've taken away from a few decades of working in law enforcement is you have to be careful if you're going to use an extraordinary power to be limited in the way you use it. There's always a good reason to use something for tax evasion or unpaid parking tickets, but the fact is not everything is the same. And often what happens, and I think we've seen this in the metadata surveillance area, is if you allow things to be 
used for different missions, there winds up being a reaction and you lose the original tool that you had a compelling reason to want to have. So I think this is an area where um, sustainability and self-discipline are important elements of any proposal. Yeah, that last point, I mean, in terms of the, you know, the, Sto the Snowden uh, yeah. disclosures and so on, I was in the FBI a few months after that, and it really negatively impacted the, the Bureau's abilities across a, a range of different things, that, that the, the concern being it just, there was such a negative public reaction to what people thought we were doing um, in any event. Okay, Mike, uh, any final words? We're about ready to sign off here, but uh, just give you the last word here. No, I mean, I, look, if Congress wants to really take a serious look at this issue and see what the options are, I have, I have no issue with that. And I think they could stand to be educated. Um, I would not like to see this simply be a device, um, you know, kind of secretly to push weakening encryption, because I think particularly now in the wake of the virus, when more and more work is going to be online and it's probably going to stay online, if we have weak encryption, we are going to do a lot of damage to our economy and even to our safety. Okay. Mike Chertoff, thank you very much for your time. I, I know you're busy dealing with a lot of different things, so I, I appreciate it. Uh, I, so I, I do think it's an important topic that everybody needs to be more educated on, including me. So thank you very much, and, uh, and I'll see you soon, hopefully. Take care. Right. Thanks, uh, everybody, for attending, and uh, have a good day.